Who's your favorite character in American literature? If I had to pick mine, I'd pick someone who is very different than me, and yet I think a lot about. I've probably actually thought about this character more than any other character in any book in my whole life. No, it's not Captain Ahab, though I think Captain Ahab is a fascinating character. No, it's not Jay Gatsby. It's not Sethi from Beloved, though she's a very fascinating character in her own right. No, my favorite character, the character I think most about in all of literature, not just American literature, is a girl from a French colony in Canada named Evangeline. Now, Evangeline, I would argue, is Longfellow's greatest creation, both the character and the poem she inhabits. Evangeline was written by Longfellow after he had had many years of tragedy, heartbreak, waiting, patient enduring, thinking that the woman he fell in love with after he lost his first wife would never love him, and then being surprised to find that she loved him and wanted to marry him. Longfellow had been through a lot of life when he went to write Evangeline. Evangeline was published in 1847, and it became and remains probably the public's and the public's favorite Longfellow book, and also the most critically and technically successful of Longfellow's poems. What is it about this character, and what is it about this poem that's so important and so unique and so successful? I want to begin talking about that today by talking about the first part of Evangeline. Evangeline is a poem of almost 1,400 lines. It's broken in half into parts one and two. Part one tells a story of Evangeline's youth. Part two picks up a few years later and talks about her middle age. I want to talk about part one in this first video. Evangeline is such an important heroine, she needs more than one video. I wrote a few years ago a whole book about Evangeline. Uh, it's called Glimpses of Her Father's Glory. The subtitle is a mouthful. It's Deification and Divine Light in Longfellow's Evangeline. This is really an exploration of Longfellow as a theological thinker and Longfellow as uh, interacting with both early Christian ideas, biblical ideas, 19th century Unitarian and transcendentalist ideas in his writing on Evangeline. But at the end, it makes the argument that Evangeline should be seen as an incredibly successful heroine, as both a poetic creation and as also a picture of theological and American cultural imagination. But I don't want to talk about that quite yet. What I want to tell you is why you should care about Evangeline and why you should start to get to know her. Now, Evangeline has a very famous opening as a poem. It starts like this. This is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks, bearded with moss and in garments green, indistinct in the twilight, stand like druids of Eld with voices sad and prophetic. This is a very famous opening. It's written in a strange meter, dactylic hexameter. The rhythm is da 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 this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlocks. It's a long line. It's very sonorous. Some people have mistaken Evangeline for being written in prose. The lines are so long. But Longfellow proved that this strange meter, it's a meter he borrowed from Homer and Virgil. Uh, it's not the meter of Shakespeare. It's a much more ancient meter. He proved that a long poem could be written in it. What most, what most should interest us, though, is the end of this opening section where Longfellow writes, Ye who believe in affection that hopes and endures and is patient, ye who believe in the beauty and strength of woman's devotion, list to the mournful tradition still sung by the pines of the forest, list to a tale of love in Acadie, home of the happy. Acadie is another word for Acadia, which is the region of eastern Canada that the town of Grand Prix where the story is set, takes place. Grand Prix was a small farming village of French colonists. And when we meet Evangeline, she's a young girl uh, in her teens. She has a beloved father, Benedict Bellefontaine. Uh, Bellefontaine, their last name means something like beautiful fountain. Uh, the fountain imagery we'll talk about in the next video becomes very important in the poem. But Evangeline seems like a very conventional, almost boring, almost disappointingly uh, idealized character. She's religiously devout. She goes to church. Uh, she loves 
uh, a boy named Gabriel who uh, it's it's not a forbidden love. Their fathers, in fact, want them to get married. Uh, the central scene of the opening section of the poem is uh, their betrothal. The village celebrates their betrothal. Evangeline is spoken of as uh, carrying her chaplet of beads and her missile to church every day. Uh, celestial light seems to glow from her face after confession. She seems almost too perfect. In fact, an early critic uh, of this poem wrote that she's an insipid creature. Two caveats to that. I think when we meet a character who really is innocent and really does seem morally upright with no flaws, we shouldn't immediately assume that they're a bad character. We need to make room for many types of people and characters in our imagination. Second, if we think, reading the opening sections of this poem, that all's going to go well for this character, we're in for quite a surprise. The surprise comes from political violence. And who's a better political enemy in an American poem than the English? Towards the end of the first part of this, after Gabriel and Evangeline have been engaged, the town celebrates, the English ships show up, and the English soldiers come in, they gather all the men of the village into the church, leaving all the women and children at home wondering when are the men going to come out. They keep them there all night, and they tell the men, you need to pack up all your belongings, and you need to leave. We're bringing ships in, we're going to ship you off from here. England will now rule it, and we don't want any French people living here anymore. It's a forced deportation. This actually happened. Uh, This is part of the conflict that surrounds the French and Indian War, where the English and French are jockeying for power in the New World. And the citizens of Grand Prix famously uh, were horribly treated by the English. I want to pick up for you by reading the end of part one, where things get quite dire indeed. Halfway down to the shore, Evangeline waited in silence, not overcome with grief, but strong in the hour of affliction. Calmly and sadly she waited, until the procession approached her, and she beheld the face of Gabriel, pale with emotion. Tears then filled her eyes, and eagerly running to meet him, clasped she his hands, and laid her head on his shoulder, and whispered, Gabriel, be of good cheer, for if we love one another, nothing in truth can harm us, whatever mischances may happen. Smiling, she spake these words, then suddenly paused, for her father she saw slowly advancing. Alas, how changed was his aspect. Gone was the glow from his cheek and the fire from his eye, and his footstep heavier seemed with the weight of the heavy heart in his bosom. But with a smile and a sigh, she clasped his neck and embraced him, speaking words of endearment where words of comfort availed not. Thus to the Gaspero's mouth moved on that mournful procession, There disorder prevailed, and the tumult and stir of embarking. Busily plied the freighted boats, and in the confusion, wives were torn from their husbands, and mothers too late saw their children left on the land, extending their arms with wildest entreaties. So unto separate ships were Basil and Gabriel carried, while in despair on the shore Evangeline stood with her father. They watched their city burn as they sit on the shore. It's a terrifying scene that there's a a light that, that glows up and it looks like sunrise, but they realize it's the flames that the British have set in their houses. All the flocks rush out of their enclosures, out of the pastures as the pastures burn. It's one of the worst things that can happen in human history, happens at the end of part one of Evangeline. And Longfellow knew both the deportation of the Acadians, the forced uh, removal of slaves from the west coast of Africa. He knew that these things had happened and were happening in the world. And so he creates this character who's very resilient, uh, who's very innocent, who's very pure, and he puts her into a place in history that broke people, that broke cities, that broke whole communities' ability to be a community. It's a cultural destruction that he places his heroine at the center of. And he asks us, can you believe in love? Can you believe in devotion? Can you believe in endurance? 
as imperial violence destroys the world that I created in front of you. And this is why I think Evangeline is such a heroine. Because he takes everything away from her as a writer, Longfellow does. And then he says, how can she be a heroine? She's no hardened adventurer. She's no queen. She's just a girl. She's just a teenager who is in love with a boy. And that boy is forced onto another ship with his father. Evangeline's father dies on the seashore, watching his city burn. And at the end of part one, Evangeline ends up on a boat, and uh, her local priest is one of the only people she knows on the boat. And they sail off down south to America. Being displaced and finding yourself in America is one of the big themes of lots of American literature. What do you do if you're from a non-Protestant culture what do you do if you're from a non-Anglo culture and you find yourself in America? How will America treat you? Can you survive in America? Somebody like Phyllis Wheatley, a few years before Longfellow, had experienced this too. She was stolen from her parents in Gambia, sold uh, to slavers who took her across the ocean, across the Middle Passage, when she was nine years old. She ends up in America. She's sold to a British family. She becomes one of the great poets of American history. I don't know if Longfellow was thinking of Phyllis Wheatley, but it's the challenge he gives his heroine here. What happens when they force you onto a ship and put you in, into a new place where people are going to look down on you for your culture, for your religion? In part two, we're going to see how Evangeline fares. But I want to encourage you, Evangeline is an amazing book. It can try our patience with the I idyllic setting of Acadia at the beginning. But by the end, I think if you haven't fallen in love with the characters, especially with the heroine, um, I think you haven't been paying close enough attention. Next time, we're going to talk about Evangeline in exile after the fall of this Eden, where she wasn't Eve, she wasn't Satan, she was an innocent. Can you be heroic in that situation? We'll see you next time.